I'm going to summarize the content here with four words. Okay, Bigger, slower, older, and more urban. When the poor countries realized that their children were surviving, they started lowering their fertility, and the great population growth rate began to decline. And it's fallen from 2.1 to about 1.1. It's a little bit lower probably now. It's fallen by half in 40 years. That is an extraordinary achievement, and it wasn't done by coercion. It was done because people wanted it. So the fraction of resources that societies will have to put into schooling can be concentrated on a smaller number of children. This is a fabulous opportunity to improve the quality of education instead of diluting it with a huge fraction of children. It, all population growth will be in the cities of poor countries, not in cities that look like that. People are concentrated in cities. Half of all people, about 3 billion plus or minus, live in cities on less than 3% of the land area. They live at a density of 500 people per square kilometer. That works out to one person per every 40, 45 meters squared. If you took the less densely settled half of the Earth's surface, it would have only 2% of the world's people. So half of the Earth is virtually empty. The bigger the city, the lower the fertility rates. And the more contraceptive use in the bigger the city. And the need for contraception is greatest in the rural and small urban areas. Cities will face an unprecedented confluence of rapid increase in total numbers of people and numbers of elderly. Example, in front of Rockefeller University, where I work for a living, there are two bus stops. This one has no seat. This one has a bench. This is elder friendly. If you're standing there with your bag of stuff, you can put your bag down or you can sit down. We need this. We don't need this. These are doorknobs in my hallway. If you have an arthritic hand, you can't make head nor tail out of this. Try to open this doorknob with, a, with your elbow. This you can open with your elbow. Okay? You've got to think. We're going to have more older people. Let's design our cities and our buildings for older people. The number of people 60 plus will triple by 2050. The number of people 80 plus will quadruple by 2050. Cities occupy about 3% of the land. Most of them are there because they're surrounded by prime agricultural land. It was a great place to get food. If cities double, as they are expected to, are they going to double their area? If so, they're going to eat up the land that feeds them. Or are they going to go up in density? We have to think about the environmental impacts of our demographic changes so we're prepared for what we're doing. The world today grows enough food to feed 10 billion people a vegetarian diet today. Yet we have between 800 million and a billion people chronically hungry, according to some estimates. Of the grain that we grow, 40% goes into domestic animal mouths. That means if I grow 10 pounds of grain, six of it goes to people and four of it goes to animals. Wheat has doubled in the last year. Corn has gone up 50%. Rice has gone up. I don't. Peter will know the numbers. I, I, I cut those slides. Who does it hurt? It hurts the poor. This is per capita income, log scale. So this is 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, et cetera, on some scale. And this is the fraction of the consumer price index devoted to buying food. And what you see is that the poor people spend much more of their income on food than the rich people. So if the price of food goes up, big deal. It means I can't go to the movies. But for these people, it means they're hungry or hungrier. First, let's get it clear. This food crisis is not driven by population growth. Malthus was wrong. He's still wrong. Um, this food crisis is driven by a set of factors uh, that may be very, very deep underneath. There's some population 
uh, dynamics to it. But, uh, but all the production numbers divided by all the population numbers still show that there's a huge surplus of food out there if, there's, if, if the mechanisms uh, if, of access are, are, are there. That was true 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 25 years ago. It's still true today. Partly the reason we're running out of food is because, guess what? We're richer. Uh, not a bad thing, I guess I would argue as, as an economist, uh, that India and China are, are getting richer. Uh, they're using more resources. Uh, that's, that's a good thing uh, in terms of their own development. The rest of the world probably needs to get used to the fact that we're, we're not the only rich part of, of the world any, any longer. Uh, it would, I think, be a very good thing if we can move people faster into the cities at higher standards of living, leaving more land per person to, to, for, for cultivation. Uh, it's really hard for a family to make a living on five-tenths uh, of a hectare, on one acre of land. If they have two or three acres, you've got a shot at a decent standard of living for the people who stay behind in the, the, the rural areas. He was hinting at some very real advantages of a more urban population. It's easier to educate people. It's easier to reach them with modern health care facilities. They are more efficient in energy utilization if you stack them up and use buses than if people are driving around uh, in, in automobiles. The most efficient energy use region in the United States is New York City, and Manhattan is the best. Uh, we don't tend to think of that, but if we're worried about increasing energy efficiency, if we're worried about scale activities and getting services both to the elderly and to women, uh, having people in cities is not all bad. Now, what is difficult is you have to feed them and you have to get the food to them. So I'm going to wrap up with just a couple of points. First, we will have PowerPoint available on our website. We have uh, an initiative website called Demographics and Development at the CGD org website, so please visit that. We'll be putting more content up as we move through this initiative, including the research papers and presentations that are part of this series. Uh, secondly, I think that we've touched on some key points that we will be uh, digging into deeper, including uh, data and, and what good data are not available and how to get them, and what poor data uh, misinform us about and lead us in the wrong direction, including choices among policy approaches and how to analyze those choices and understand the trade-offs and including differences across regions and, and some of the other issues brought up today. So I think a, a very excellent discussion. Thank you to our speakers and to our audience for joining us. And I'd like to add my thanks to the audience for excellent questions and for your attentiveness and uh, for being here.